Hey everyone, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. As you know, it's all Beatles here on this channel. We talk about the Beatles, their years together, their solo years, what's going on in the news occasionally. And in just about every show, we welcome a special guest to our channel. This time it's Gary Burr, who many of you know for working with Ringo, going all the way back to uh, the Ringo Rama album. And then uh, in the albums after the whole Mark Hudson and the Roundheads period, he's appeared on most of Ringo's albums, writing songs for Ringo, and uh, and he'll even be involved, as he has told us, in the upcoming country album that Ringo is working on right now. And um, he's had an amazing career beyond, <laughs> well beyond working with Ringo, working with so many people, especially in the country field. He's written many songs that were hits from People to uh, Garth Brooks, Reba McIntyre, Leon Rimes. He was involved with uh, Joey Mullins' uh, album that came out a few years ago as well. Um, so we welcome Gary Burr to Ken Michael. Hi, it's great to be here. Great to be here. Yeah, um, we just started a new feature called The Deeper You Go, and the whole idea behind that is to pick 10 songs from either one of the Beatles in his solo career, or the Beatles as a group, that are not hits, songs that are lesser known that you feel should be given special recognition. And Gary has agreed to do this because Ringo's birthday is coming up on July the 7th. And so to honor Ringo, and we can really do this any time of the year anyway, but Ringo's birthday is coming up. So to celebrate, we're doing this show. But before we talk about Gary's picks for the obscure songs that he really loves from Ringo that he feels should be acknowledged and recognized, Gary has a brand new book out, which is called Reunion. And uh, a rock and roll fairy tale, let's call it. Can you tell us what this book's all about? Well, just uh, it's a it is a fiction book hmm. for all Beatle fans and Beatle loves lovers out there. Uh, the opening chapter is a rainy night in Hawaii, and uh, a taxi cab skids on the road and gets uh, t-boned by a truck, and the passenger in the back seat gets killed. And the police pull the body out and look at the wallet, and it's Mark David Chapman, which means John never, just by a sheer fluke of a taxi cab skidding on a wet Hawaiian night, uh, he never gets to New York. John never dies. And when it gets to be when Linda passes away, they all, as 58-year-olds, say, maybe it's time we bury the hatchet and do a show together and it's you know being that i've been in a million bands and been working with ringo for so long i kind of know what it's like to be in that rehearsal room or that office room talking about getting back together and basically you know when's the last time you played the guitar do you remember any of the songs uh -huh. how are we going to tell everybody how do we keep the world from going crazy again like it did last time what if it doesn't go crazy and nobody cares that's all what the book is. It's called Reunion. It's uh, available right now on Amazon. And it's actually at the top of the Amazon charts right now. Uh, wow. A lot of people are enjoying it. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank um, you. Very excited. Does it cover this whole period up to Linda's death and, and whether nope. or not the band's considering it or just nope. Linda dies? The first chapter is in 1980. The next chapter is in uh, is the is the a week after Linda passes away and the book is just, do they make it to the show without killing each other <laughs> or without Yoko killing one of them? Okay. Uh, do you get to talk about um, what they would do? Well, this is specifically for a concert or maybe to make an album as just well. A concert. Well, just a concert. And along the way, they start to think, Maybe this could be more, and some of them are for it, and some of them are against it. And one thing Paul does insist on is that Paul and John write a brand new song for the concert. Oh, very nice. And that is a song that I wrote, pretending to be John and Paul, and the song is included in the book, and Ringo plays on it. It's a CD or something in the book, or what? No, it's a QR code that sends you to a Magic Land where you can download a song. 
Very Don't nice. ask me how it works. I'm too old. Now, uh, I imagine Ringo is aware of the book, right? Ringo is aware of the book. He's absolutely aware of the book. He, I told, I, I kept him a prize way back when I was first starting it. Uh, his reaction was, "Good luck with it. I don't want to read it. I'll wait till it comes out and then I'll shit all over it." <laughs> I could just hear him saying that. Yep, and that's fine. I get it. Are there any discussions of what the material is going to be in the in the show? Because you have to imagine at that point, with all the solo music that they've done, are they going to divide it between group songs, solo songs? Is it all going to be Beatles or? Everything you're saying is part of a big argument around a big corporate table on the third floor of Barney's in New York City. <laughs> what does it look like? George wants to play 15 minutes and leave. Paul wants to play three hours and have it include everything. And, and John doesn't know why he's there at all. Very interesting. <laughs> it's a fun book. I'll send it to you. Okay. Maybe we'll do a promotion and, and giveaway copies if you want. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. It was really fun to write it. I started it right before the pandemic and uh, it's just out. Uh, it's just out. Actually it comes out it's today. The, today the th it comes out on the fifth. Okay. But you can pre-order it whenever you feel like it. I know it's on Amazon and we have the link in the description box. If you want to order that. Great. And can you order it off your website? Because I know you have the photo of the of the. No, but there's a link on the website to go to Amazon. It's it's either or. Either you're selling it or they're selling it, and they do a better job. Okay. All right. So as I said before, the show is the deeper you go concept. So I'm really eager to find out what songs you've chosen as among the ones that are not that familiar to the general mainstream public and uh which ones have you chosen now these are not necessarily ranked 10 to number one these are just 10 songs that you've chosen was I this actually, I actually went from uh earliest to latest and pretty much focused on things that i worked on so that i have something you know a a, a little insight to bring to it right well, we just did the show with Bruce Sugar doing the same thing. And I was kind of surprised that he didn't want to pull anything from the 70s or 80s, but it was the same reasoning as yours because he got involved with Ringo the same time you did. Right. And, you know, I love all those albums, but my favorite things on all those albums were all the hits and they kind of broke your rule. You mm. know, I mean, I love, you know, the greatest and and songs like that. Uh, um but, you know, that's not that's not the rule. So I'm going to stick to what I know. OK. All right. Let's start with your first pick. Well, I went way back. And this is the first record that I I think the first record I was involved in, which is uh, I Want to Be Santa Claus. Uh-huh. OK. And there is a song on there called uh, The Christmas Dance. Uh -huh. And I love this song i didn't get to play on it but i got to sing on it and it's so it's so dense i mean there's so much going on the the harmonies took us forever to do there's so many of them but i didn't mind because we did them at abbey road and it was my first chance to walk into abbey road and walk into that big room and see the stairs going up the side to the control room. And we were down there around a microphone and, and Mark Hudson and I sang all the harmonies. And uh, it was just an incredible experience. There's a thing at the end where Ringo sings the final word, Christmas dance. And through computer manipulation, he has Ringo hold it for like, 90 seconds and after the first 30 seconds you're just laughing listening to and it just goes on and on and on and it's kind of a little private joke that mark as the producer got to pull off uh -huh. uh, but it it cracks me up every time i hear it and it's just such a, a great that's a great christmas holiday album and that's a great song on a great christmas album you know what i love about that song is that 
it, they change tempo because it's mainly four four, and then goes to a waltz. You yeah, know, towards the end. Well, so it's simulating a it's simulating a party in a ballroom, and we even all went down and clinked glasses and talked, and that's all us making those crowd noises like people are laughing and 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 drinking at a party. And, and, you know, that was like pulling people in off the hallway, going, come on, get down the microphone, here's a glass, clink, talk, show, you know, you laugh, you this and that. That was, so all the tempo changes. Yep. We're trying to take you on the journey of, you know, going to an, I don't know, a Victorian Christmas dance. <laughs> well, it works for me. I just want to say, um, one time, it might have been the first time that I interviewed Mark Hudson, I had to tell him. First of all, I love I Want to Be Santa Claus. I'm so grateful that that album came out in the first place. But the the whole idea that it was half original songs and half traditional Christmas songs, I love that whole concept. And the song Christmas Eve is so gorgeous. Yeah. It's very much like Harry Nilsson's, you know, Christmas song. And, yeah. Uh, very clever lyrics in there. Um, yeah, what talking about I see your presence on the tree, but, you know, the double, you know, entendre there with the words presence as a gift. Yeah. You're, you know, it's it, and it's a very melancholy song. And it reminds me a lot of something like Good Night, you know, especially with the orchestration and all. So. Yes. And that was an album. I think it was really the first time that. Uh, you know, that Mark and Ringo were working together. You know, that was probably the first chance they had where they were sitting down and writing songs together for this record. And it's, you know, it's always easier in a new writing relationship when right. you have a target to shoot for. Yeah. And so Christmas holiday songs, themed songs, were the target that made them come up with some great stuff. Oh, definitely. Vertical Man actually was before that. So that was probably... Was it? Okay. I wasn't exactly sure, but that's my next song <laughs> okay. is from Vertical Man. And uh, it's... Uh, when he did Vertical Man, that was when I got, yeah, it must have been, because that was when I first got involved with the Ringo experience. Mm -hmm. um, Hudson called me up and left a message on my answer machine. That's how long ago it was. Left a message on my answer machine um, talking about a project that he had and the album was was done, but he needed a band to be to put together mm. to go to London and rehearse and and then do a video and then um, you know go uh, come back to America and do a, the storytellers VH1 right. storytellers. So what we did was we had to learn. So I got this message from him to finish that part of the story. I got this message from him. I called him back and got his answering machine. And I was standing in front of my girlfriend at the time. And I tried to act all professional, like, well, you know, we'll have to see if I'm free and, and what the, uh, what the pay is like. And, and, you know, let, so call me, give me more details and I'll be able to give you an answer whether I could do it or not. Mm -hmm. And then I said to my girlfriend, I said, I'm going to go to the store and get, you know, a gallon of milk or a Coke or something. And I left and I called him from, the payphone down the street. And I said, Mark, I got his machine again. I said, I don't know who that was on the phone call before this one, but ignore him. I'll, you know, of course I'm in. So he called me later that night and he told me, he said, it's this, it's this, it's this. And I don't remember the, the price, but he said at the end, he said, he said, and it's going to be $3,000. And I said, uh, great, will Ringo take a check? <laughs> I'll pay $3,000 to play with Ringo. So that was the first time. And what we did was we learned the entire Vertical Man album mm. because we were gonna play the bottom line. Right. And uh, we just learned, I think all of them, but we certainly did What in the World. And it was always one of my favorites to learn because uh, it's just a great groove and it's a great song. and. And I don't, uh, you know, I know I didn't write it, 
Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm even singing on it because I don't remember whether or not I sang on any songs on Vertical Man because I think he called me after the record was done. Right. You know, it's because he uh, he shared a lawyer with Ringo. So when Ringo came, uh, you know, came back and kind of said, I want to get back into writing and, and playing music again, find me somebody to work with. And his lawyer went to Hudson and said, I'm going to hook you guys up. And right. that's why those two worked together so well for so long. Okay. Well, Vertical Man, the album is chock full of a lot of great songs. Why did you pick the title track? Oh, I love the title track. I, that, oh, I almost picked that one just because it, it, there's so many parts to it. I love songs that, that, that keep changing on you. And there's so many parts to that song. And so many sounds, you know, like vocally, it, it's really ambitious. Um, I love, I love that title. There's not many songs on that record I don't love. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe some of the really heavy ones are a little hard for me, you know, because I'm not a heavy, metally kind of guy. So songs like uh, "Eye to Eye" or, or things like that are a little heavy for my taste. Right. But, but I, I I loved it. I thought it was an amazing effort. Yeah, well, you know, I told Mark, and I'm so happy I had the chance to tell him this, but I just think, and believe me, I love a lot of the stuff that Ringo did after Mark, but Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, Choose Love, three absolutely solid albums, and, uh, you know, among the best of his solo career. Along with Time Takes Time, although, but they all were in a row, <laughs> you know, so that whole period. Was just absolutely so i agree with you there was just it was just a great combination of 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 talent all you know all shoulder to shoulder trying to make ringo sound as good as he could to make him be appreciated for what he is mm. i also like the way the drums were mixed and even what bruce sugar's done with the way that he mixes ringo's drums post mark hudson so it really shines a lot. And there's a lot of great fills that Ringo does on his albums. And you get to hear them on the work that, that uh, you know, Mark did and the Roundheads did with Ringo. But yeah, so I'm happy Vertical Man made the list. Yeah, yeah. I think in Mark's studio in Santa Monica that Bruce talked about, um, there was the room that had the, that had the microphone and the control room. And the, and the mixing board. And then over here was a separate room. And in the back, against the back wall of that room was the drum kit. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have a lot of sophisticated miking. It's not like they do today where there's, you know, there's a mic on the top of the snare and a mic on the bottom of the snare. And a, uh. It's basically four mics just set in just the right places that made that drum kit sound like a beetle was playing yeah hmm. but you know for people that can be super critical of ringo as a drummer there are certain songs that i would point to like eye to eye you know give me back the beat fading in fading out listen to those fills i mean they really drive the song you know yeah now give me back the beat was supposed to be two drummers on it, it was supposed to be him and uh, the Stones drummer. Charlie Watts? Charlie Watts. He was going to come over and we were going to have two drummers playing that song. And in the middle, there's drum breaks and they were going to alternate. And they had never appeared together on a record. So we were very excited. But that was right when Charlie's first bout of cancer hit him. Oh. And he... And he couldn't do it. He had to go and do chemo and stuff or radio, you know, whatever that his health made him have to cancel. And we could, and then obviously that's a giant steamroller for anybody. And we never did put it back together because we had to finish the song and finish the record. But that was supposed to be Charlie Watts and Ringo Starr playing together on the same song. That would have been amazing. And just to watch a video of the two of them together, that would have made history there <laughs> yeah. yeah well we were shooting for history yeah. yeah by any chance did i should have asked mark this question but were there times when he and ringo 
battled each other on drums because Mark can play drums. Mark can play just about anything. Oh, no, no, no. Mark, you know, Mark knows, you know, that as a drummer, he's a great songwriter. Uh huh. Uh, no, no, nothing like that at all. Um, I don't mean challenging Ringo, I mean just for fun. The two of them on two different drum kits or something. No, no. Actually, we were never anywhere where there was two drum kits. So it's not like a Greg Vissonette and Ringo up right. on stage getting to mess around together. Mm. You know, I he was very he was very territorial. The drums in Cranley were the drums from Abbey Road with those beautiful calf heads, calf skin heads. Yeah. And you know. You can't help it. One morning before anybody was there, I sit behind the drums and I'm going, I'm playing those drums. And then all of a sudden from the doorway, I hear Ringo, Gary, they're not toys. <laughs> and I put the sticks down and got up and walked away from them. They're not toys. Oh, wow. All right. What, uh, what would be your next choice? Um... I guess I'll, I guess uh, the next one chronologically after Vertical Man, wouldn't that be Ringo Rama? Yep. So I've got a few off of Ringo Rama because that's my favorite record. That was the one where I was dropped in the middle of Cranley and got to, we got to wake up in the morning and kind of warm up our fingers. Mm -hmm. And then Ringo would show up after his workout and he would tell us what the days of song. I want to write this kind of song. And here's the title. It came to me on the treadmill. And uh, let's go. And we would write it. And by after lunch, we would record it. We'd go to dinner and we'd come back and do all the overdubs. And so we would have from the beginning to the end of the night when we went to bed, we had created the whole bed of song ready for his vocal and the harmonies. Um, so that was, you know, that made Ringo Rama really special to me. We all stayed in this cottage down at the end of his driveway. Yeah. And every bedroom had one of those, you know, remember a Look magazine had those psychedelic pictures of uh -huh. them? And each one, each bedroom had one of those. And I woke up the first day, he came down and I said, yeah, I'm staying uh, in the George room. And I, I had that same poster when I was a kid growing up. That's why I picked that room. I had that same poster growing up. And right. Ringo just looked at me and went, that's the real one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, almost the same, almost the same. But uh Ringo Rama, the first one's the easy one, is uh, Imagine Me There. Yep. That was a, a title that I came up with because uh, my, my, I think my girlfriend at the time, I think I said that to her over the phone. And I ran it by Ringo. He thought, let's see where that goes. So we wrote this song um, with a drop D tuning and, and it was really pretty guitar part. Uh, when we got to the chorus, the original chorus was a little too high for Ringo to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So we dropped his part and made the harmony part be what we originally thought was going to be the chorus. So we've got this beautiful song. I don't remember who, who played what. Generally, you know, Steve Dudas, amazing electric guitar. I'm usually all the acoustic guitars. But when we were going in to write the song, we walked in and just looked around. And I, I would just, you know, I'll play bass on this one. I'll play mandolin on this one. Mm -hmm. I'll sit behind the keyboards. But everybody just didn't care what they grabbed because they knew that if they grabbed something other than what they're used to, it's going to make your brain think different and the songs would benefit from it. So I don't know what I played on that song. Um, I do know that when it was done, 
um, Mark came back from grocery shopping and said, uh, guess who I was in line at the grocery store with? Uh, who? Clapton. Really? Yeah, he's going to come over tomorrow and play a guitar solo on Imagine Me There. So I've got a song that I'm one of the writers on and Clapton's going to come over. So we're all looking out the window all day. And all of a sudden, this little nondescript station wagon pulls up. And it's just Eric. He gets out of the car, goes to the back, opens it, pulls out a little amp, pulls out a guitar, comes in. And, you know, within a few seconds, what was coming out of the amp sounded like Eric Clapton. And he played you know, three, three or four solos so that we could, you know, later we could mix and match what parts we like best. Uh -huh. and it was, uh, it was just an amazing experience to hear that guitar on a song, you know, that, that I helped create. Yeah. I've heard Mark tell that story several times. What a coincidence that Clapton was there at the supermarket or that store. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Imagine Me There is one of the greatest of, of Ringo's love songs throughout his solo career. And uh, you wrote that with him and probably Mark and maybe Steve. I'd have to look at the... the... Yeah, we were, all, we were all there. We were all there throwing in our, our, our parts. And uh, and then the last, the last uh, you know, bit of parsley into the stew was Charlie Hayden on bass. You know, on upright bass, an um, unbelievable jazz guy, and I fought it every step of the way. I'm going, that's not what this song is. That's guy, what are you doing? What are you doing? And next thing I know, I'm in Hudson's studio in Santa Monica, and Charlie Hayden carries up this big, giant, long set of stairs to get up to Hudson's. He carries up his own upright bass, and he's playing, and Ringo is there, and I'm there, and there's a video of it somewhere of me just sitting in a car going like this. <laughs> Cause I just, it was just so not what I was hearing in my head. Cause he was doing all these beautiful passing chords and staying off the roots and things. It was wonderful. And after it was over, I totally admitted to myself that I was an asshole and it was just fabulous. <laughs> It was tremendous, and it took the song to a whole nother level and makes it just magic to listen to. I guess that was Mark's idea to bring Charlie Hayden to board, right? I don't, I don't remember. I mean, Mark is not a jazz guy. I didn't know whether or not, I didn't know whether or not uh, he even knew who Charlie Hayden was. Hmm. You know, at some point, I could picture them just saying at some point in the studio together, you know, what would be good is upright bass on this. And Heaven Ringo goes, well, I know Charlie Hayden. And that's really all anyone had to say. That's yeah. like saying, you know, I think we need a piano and saying, well, I know, you know, I know, uh, uh, name a great one. I know Elton John. Yeah. You know, you just, that's the end of the conversation. Hmm. Wow. Just going back to what you said about Ringo Rama, were there all were all the songs or most of the songs done as you just described it, where just about everything was done in one day, and then all that had to be done was Ringo laying down his vocals or drums? Or or no, no, no. He when I'm I mean he was as we were writing the song, we were sitting around knee to knee. Right. Ringo sitting there, Dudas there with his guitar, Hudson with his guitar or the bass, me with my guitar, uh, Dean Grickell with his pad, hmm. you know, and and uh, once lunchtime came and we had it written, uh -huh. we kind of knew what it was going to sound like because usually it was Ringo walking in going, let's write a song that sound that, with this groove. So after lunch, that was when we would record it, but we would record it with Ringo. And that's what's most amazing was, you know, you forget, you know, they would probably cut a Beatles song 40 times. 
But it always amazed me when we would do like five passes and and one of us would go, I don't think we got it yet. And I would go, oh God, just let him off the hook. You know, let's keep the drums and we'll we'll play again. But he didn't want that. He wants to be in a band. Yeah. And he would be the first one to go, come on, let's go. Let's get it again. And he would do as many passes as until everybody looked and went, that's the one. And then, you know, it would take us all afternoon to get the basic tracks. And then after dinner, we'd come back and go, we need a little guitar here. You know, it'd be really nice. Grab that thing and play it and you know, put a shaker in here, Ringo and blah, blah. And then by the time we went to bed, it was ready it was ready for us to think about whether it was done except for vocals. Okay. You know, the next day or five days later, Hudson might go, Hey, I thought of a cool piano thing or an organ thing or a string thing we can do on, you know, so put up the song we did three days ago and uh, I want to try something, you okay. know, or do it as will be playing something and go, Oh my God, that sound on the song four days ago would be awesome. So pull it up and let's put that down. So once we had a whole bunch of tracks, any day we could just pick a song and listen to it and go, "Ooh, I know what else we could do." Right. It was it was a it was a party. It was fabulous. So all the songs were not completed, but close to being completed in in a day. Yes. That's amazing. You know, you've you've heard Paul McCartney talk about Beatles sessions that for a certain period. He and John would have songs that they had written. They'd come into the studio, teach it to George and Ringo, and they'd have it done in a day. You know, so he yeah. missed he missed that kind of approach and that spontaneity, or you know, to get things done so quickly, to not overthink too much. You know, and so this almost kind of reminds me of that. But then, you know, you touch it up these songs later on with whatever you felt like. Right, and you know, he did have the luxury of you know, some really good players, you know, we, we, we didn't have to spend a lot of time, you know, redoing our tracks, right. you know, we, we pretty much couldn't, could, could nail it. It was, it was, it was terrific. And it was, it was just, you know, we had a big, a big cork board and every time we would get the track done, we would take the, the, the lyric sheet and pin it to the board so we could see our progress as lyric sheets are pinned to the board. Hmm. And it was just such a fun way to do it. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been involved in albums where you've worked on one song for days. Right. And uh, that's, you know, that is sort of the Paul versus John style. Mm -hmm. Paul, it's, uh, you know, I think we could do it I think we could do it better. Why don't we try the 51st take? And John was like, yeah, I know I sang the wrong words, but so what? Let's move on. Mm. You know, we were more of the, you know, we weren't moving on with anybody making any mistakes. But to tell you the truth, Ringo was the first one to always say, he, and he said, this, is, this was our philosophy all the way back to the Beatles. There are no mistakes. We would ask him, we would go, yeah, every once in a while, I mean, he was talking about the Beatle days. Mm. And one of us would ask and go, why is it that this happened here, but then later it doesn't happen in the song? What yeah. were you thinking? And he would say, I was lost. I, you know, I put Simul Crash in there because I thought John was going to a bridge, but I was lost. And I didn't, until somebody started singing, I didn't know where I was, but we didn't redo it. We just went, wow, there's a cool symbol crash where no one is going to expect it. Right. And so he always told us there are no mistakes, you know, unless we drop our instruments, whatever it is, is just a new, a new facet to the song. Yeah. Well, he would say that he would go with his feel at the moment, whatever he felt like playing. And uh, like, for example, if you listen to different takes of Day Tripper, you know, he's not playing the exact same thing on drums every single time. The fill here could be different from the fill later on. So, yeah, it makes you wonder, why aren't you playing it exactly the same way every time? But 
he went with what he felt like at the moment, you know. It, that is so funny you said that. I was just driving with my friend uh, Mark Miranda and, and that song came on the radio and he made some comment about the drum part and how consistent it was. I, and I said, it's, it, it's not consistent. When they come back from the first bridge, he doesn't play it at all. And then he plays it again. Oh, he plays it that way. That's the distinctive so, you know, beat. He keeps it up all through. And we listen. He goes, son of a gun. He's not doing it in the second verse. And then he's doing it again, almost like he forgot. You know, either he forgot or maybe, you know, George Martin flew in apart from another take where he wasn't doing it. Who knows? Whatever it is, it didn't keep the song from being a Beatles song. Right. And whatever he did, whatever they did, worked. So. Yep. All right. We can okay. Get conversation. Uh, keep it on the same record. Okay. English Garden. Hmm. Okay. That song has such fond memories for me. Uh, it just was, it just was sort of like all of Ringo's philosophy in, in one song. And recording it was so fun because we, we did it all in real time. Like we, you know, there's, there's the sound of rain and we, we're out in the storm with umbrellas and a microphone to keep the mic dry and to record the rain falling on his English garden. And we're all like, shh, shh. We, we just need a whole solid minute <laughs> of nobody talking or burping or anything and just see if we could get a solid. And it took us so long to get a solid minute because there's a little thunder and there's, a, you know, it's gorgeous. And then we did the same thing to capture the sound of the horse of a Barbara's horse yeah. and then her voice. And, uh, you know, it, it, it mentioned Buster, his dog, who was in the studio with us every second of making that record. And, uh, it was just, it was just a, such a sweet, sweet, sentimental, romantic, english song mm -hmm. i loved it and i love the fact that he he put a little bit of uh let him in in there he uh he called paul and said paul i just want to give you a heads up that at the end of a song on my new record i sing a little bit of you know I sing a little bit of let him in and paul said well you know rich you really should have you know, let somebody know before you did that. And he said, I'm letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go right to the source. Yeah. So, you know, sue me. <laughs> and uh, one more off of Ringo Rama, if you're okay, moving on from English Garden. Sure. Is uh, Tripping on My Own Tears. Hmm. That was... Ringo came back from somewhere and he had been talking to someone who had just gone through a real sad experience. And the guy said to him, this was one of the rare night writing sessions, I think, because he came back, Ringo came back and he said, and this guy said, I was so shook up that I was I was tripping on my own tears. And Ringo just said to himself, wow, tripping on my own tears. Hmm. And he came back, came running up to the studio, gathered everybody together, said, here's what we're going to do. And so we, we wrote it as a really fun, interesting song. And uh, Dudas had found this guitar hanging on the wall that had the tone controls were all these colored switches. Hmm. Instead of in knobs, they were big, bright color switches that you throw. Okay. Not switches like, not toggles, but switches. And Ringo said he had gotten it from the estate sale of uh, John Entwistle's estate. 
Oh. It was John Entwistle's guitar, and it was sold in an estate sale, and they sold it to Ringo, and it was hanging on the wall. And it was the greatest, weirdest sounding guitar. So when you hear all the doo -doo 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 and that, that's all that crazy guitar with the colored switches. Yeah. And uh, actually on my website, I have a picture of me out in the backyard of Ringo's holding that guitar because it was such a one in a one in a million kind of guitar, the way it looked. So that was really uh that made that song really fun and just the beat of it. And that might've been one where I played bass on it. I'm not sure, but it was just, it was just really, really fun and uh, very adventurous. Yeah. I hate to tell you this, but I, I love the song, but it reminds me of another song altogether, melodically. Really? Yeah. <laughs> You want to know what it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when the red, red robin goes by, <laughs> it along. <laughs> is, isn't that public domain by now? I don't know. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I guess nobody thought of that when, they, when you were writing it, huh? That's only that part of the song. Maybe we thought we could get away with changing that one note. Da, 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 da. Sometimes that's all it takes to keep you out of court. All right. By the way, since you mentioned that you're not as much into Ringo when he does the heavy stuff, were you a big fan of Instant Amnesia? Because that song blows me away from Ringo Rama. I mean, I, it was, as you can imagine, it was a blast to do. Yeah. You know, it was a blast to record because it was just, it was, you know, it was rock and roll. Yeah, and it was loud, and it was it, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it's just you know, it's just a question of taste. I can't I can't dislike it because you know part of my DNA is in it. Um, it you know, it, it's a it's a really fun song. It's just not one of my favorites. Okay, well, you know, Ringo has has gone on record saying he doesn't like doing drum solos. And yet in Instant Amnesia, he's doing yeah. a lot of solos in there. And it's so yeah. atypical of what you expect from him. And I asked Mark, I said, why why doesn't he do more of that? And Mark said, I don't know. It's what he felt like in the moment. So that's just how he is. And a song like that finds what it wants to be while you're recording it 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 wasn't that heavy when we wrote it hmm. it wasn't that heavy when we did the first passes you take the first pass and add 42 more electric guitars you got yourself a really heavy song <laughs> now, i mean i mean i'm exaggerating but you know at any point recording that song we could have thrown some acoustics on it and it would have made it you know, a lot less and would have made it certainly lighter. Mm. But I think as a counterweight to the pretty songs like Imagine Me There, right. I think they needed it to go. I'm sure that Hudson and Ringo both felt the need to throw a little counterweight on the record and and make it, you know, to, to not let people think that, that Ringo was... Uh, you know, couldn't helter skelter with the best of them. Mm. Right. It's a joy for me to listen to that whole album. Well, I, like I said, all the Mark Hudson produced, it's all fantastic material. Okay. I think we're, we went through five, is it? So, are we okay. Gonna... Yes, we did. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what the next record was. Was that, uh, Choose Love? Choose Love? Yeah. That was the next album after... Yeah. yeah. I don't have anything from Choose Love, even though I love the record. Hmm. Um, I went a little farther up. Uh, Liverpool 8. Okay. Um, love Is. Okay. I, I don't think anybody is on that except me and Ringo writing that song. Because I remember writing it in his living room. 
And I remember that when it was over, he was like so happy with it. He just said, this is one of my favorite love songs that I've written. And it was really tailored to, to singing about, channeling about, uh, you know, his love for Barbara. And uh, so I was really proud of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, another one on Liverpool 8 is Harry's song. Yeah. It's like you mentioned before, you know, he, it's almost like Harry Nilsson is a presence that hovers around Ringo to this day. And uh, he, he wanted to just write a song that was a tribute to Harry. And mm -hmm. that was a great gauntlet thrown to Hudson because you know, years later, Mark got to actually do an album with, you know, with demos that Harry had before he passed away. Right. And uh, so it was a great challenge for Hudson to write, to to create this song and have it be as Harry Nilsson as, as he could make it, you know? Mm. So the melody is very Harry Nilsson. And... Uh, it, it's just, it was just really fun to do. And uh, it's the only song in my, in my career that I get a credit for whistling. <laughs> uh, at the end of the song, uh, they said, we need, wh he liked to whistle. And I said, I'm a good whistler. And they sent me out there on the mic and I whistled a little whistle solo at the end of the song. And, and very proud of that. I get my, uh, my union checks for whistling every uh, three months. That's a separate check. <laughs> yeah, separate check. Still nothing, but still. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that you know that was that was really uh, that was fun to do that. Liverpool Eight is the one. Was that the one that uh, that uh, Dave Stewart took over? Yep. Yeah, that was a. That was tough. There were a couple of songs on there that were going in a great direction. And when they came out, they were different than we expected them to be because it got taken out of Mark's hands. So Dave Stewart made a lot of changes with the songs that not a lot of changes. Um, you know, some of them were some of them basically were just a, a quick remix touch up. Uh -huh. um, a couple of them were added overdubs and a couple of them were you know, we're, we're different enough that, you know, that they, when I listen to them, I get a little sad. Okay. With what might have been. Um, going back to Love Is, that's a very, very beatle sounding song to me. And I think that's the one, because there's a certain chord progression that's very common, where it's like a, a major chord, then an augmented, then I guess it's a minor chord, and then, and then a seventh you know uh i think you use that in love is i think that's even used in vertical man you know come on yes, it's really popular. yeah so i recognize that when i hear that in a song but it's it certainly reminds me of a, a beatles song and harry's song is a real joy also because you know mark was a big fan of harry too and if you go back to um Missouri Loves Company, one of yeah. my favorite songs. At the very end of the song, they sing, We Love You, Harry. So, right. Yep. Missouri Loves Company was was a, a lyric that was a lot of it already pre-written by Dean Raquel, wonderful lyricist. And, uh, you know, and we turned it into a song and and uh, yanked on it and pulled on it and, and got it into the shape that you hear on the record but you know that was that 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 cool lyric title twist that dean right. was so good at yeah yeah i've talked about this with you and with mark about that song because it's so clever it's got that kind of a georgia on my mind kind of approach where it could be about the state of georgia but it could be about my girlfriend georgia yeah you know, it's the same thing with missouri loves company yep yeah it, it was really you know, he was he was proud of that one. Yep. Yes, Virginia, there's a world you see. 
but without you, where can it be? You know, it could be the state of Georgia, it could be your yeah. girlfriend, Georgia. So I love that stuff. Anyway, so what's the next song? Uh, I'm up to the, the new EPs, I think. Well, I think on Why Not, uh, he and I wrote a song called Can't Do It Wrong. Uh-huh. It was another one in his office. Uh, I went out to, you know, every time I'd go out to L.A., I'd, I'd stop by. And if he wasn't feeling ambitious, I'd have a cup of tea. If he was, we'd go into his office and try to write a song. And uh, I just love that song. Can't do it wrong in the way they recorded it with the horns and slide guitar and stuff. It really you know, what we would do is we would write a song in his office or his living room, and then we would take it in the back studio where Bruce Sugar always seemed to be sitting there. <laughs> and he would sit behind the drums. I would sit in a mic with an acoustic guitar and a mic to sing it. And we would track it. And sometimes they would use those drums Sometimes, most of the time, out of sheer courtesy and because he's a sweet guy, he would keep enough of the acoustic, even though it probably had a little bit of my vocal bleeding on it. But he would keep my acoustic in there just so on the credits it would say acoustic guitar, so and so, and and me. <laughs> and uh, I would leave. And the next time I would hear that song would be, you know, all these great players on it. You know, you know, whether it's Joe Walsh or, or Ben Mott, yeah. all these players are on these songs that I just, you know, I just was happy that to, to play some guitar and, and do it four or five times until Ringo and I looked at each other and goes, that's what it's supposed to be. And then he would take it from there. But that was one of those songs that, shocked me when i heard all the stuff on it uh -huh. really proud of that song it was so fun to write because it kind of had an old fashioned it's a very old-fashioned tin pan alley um uh you know a uh, um, maxwell silver hammer kind of melody and uh i loved it and i loved what what he and bruce did with it after they kicked me out and I went down to uh, Mel's diner and had a milkshake and went, what the hell just happened? <laughs> it's got kind of like a barroom type feel. Yes. It really kind of how I look at it. It sounds like a whole bunch of people playing together, even though they're not. But yeah. I love that vibe. Okay. Excellent choice there. I love hearing these picks, Gary. <laughs> good, good, good. I think we're close. Maybe two more? Yep. Okay. Um, Give More Love. I wrote a song with them called Standing Still. Oh, yeah. That I really, I, I like the sentiment of it. He was in a period where he would, he had, like electronic drums and he had an electronic keyboard and he would build these tracks all different. You know, he would just find a cool groove on the keyboard and then play stuff to it and, and play drums to it. And he would have like eight of them. And I would come to his house and he would sit me down. He would play me the eight of them. He'd go, well, I'm not going to play you number two because Richard Marx is working on that one. I'm not going to play you number six because Dave Stewart has already claimed that one. But here are the rest of them. And I will. Oh, okay. I really like number five. Can we do that one? Cause that's, you know, a little, uh, it felt a little country felt yeah. a little, it felt like it could be a clever song. And, and then boom, number five is what we worked on. I figured out how to, how to play it. So we didn't have to listen to the track anymore. And then he would flip out a little notepad and, and it would be all these title ideas. Just like we do it here in Nashville. You sit down with somebody, you got a piece of paper or your phone with 20 titles. And how about blah, 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 blah. 
I don't know what we would do with that. What about blah, 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 blah? Because yeah. no, I wrote a song like that. What about blah, blah, blah? And I just went through the titles and I saw, I saw that song. I saw Standing Still. And I thought about, you know, the next step is what can that mean? And, you know, we both settled on that, on what the song became. And we ended up writing the song and did the same thing. Went back in the studio, played it. He kicked me out. Strawberry milkshake on on uh, on Hollywood Boulevard on Sunset, and uh, it was a wonderful day. It's so fascinating to me the whole the different ways that you can write songs. And do you find it easy? Even forget about being handed song titles. You're given these backing tracks. You're given these grooves. Do you automatically hear things in your head that could work? Does is that an easy process for you, or is it easier if you're just given a song title and maybe your mind can go from there? Well, the less the less it's written when I get involved, the better I like it. Uh-huh. You know, I don't like putting words to somebody else's la la la's. Uh-huh. You know, I my, I would prefer like this. It was a title and just a groove. And then what can that be? You know, I <clears throat> I always say you got a title and you got a picture of building with windows all around the building. Mm. And you put the title in the middle of the building and you walk around, you look through. Let's say it's a man and a woman hugging. Yeah. And you look in through this window and you go, oh, they're in love. It's a love song. You walk around to this window and now you have a different perspective and you see the woman's got a butcher knife behind her back. <laughs> oh. Oh no, this is a crime song. This is like Billy Joe McAllister. This is that kind of a song. Uh-huh. And you go, hold on. You walk a few more and you look and you go, oh, from this angle, I can see behind the guy, there's a turkey. It's Thanksgiving. It's a it's a holiday song. And you go, hold on. And then you're walking around and you every you don't take what the first window tells you. You walk around and go, okay, now I've seen six different things it could be, which is going to be the road less traveled so that people go, Oh, that's a song like that. Again, I've heard a million of them. Mm. And the one that opens up the most opportunities, you know, that you feel like you can really dig your teeth into because it's going to be a day of work. You better enjoy it. Very interesting. You know, that's I was just thinking about uh, when, when I had Bruce on the previous show and one of the songs he picked was So Wrong for So Long. Right. You know, and I'm wondering, why is he saying that until you hear the last verse that his girlfriend found somebody else? So it's kind of like, I like the twist in that. You don't think that that's where it's going to lead. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's that's waiting to look through the right window. Right. And to make it, you know, the, the world doesn't need another love song. You know, uh, writing another love song is just, you know, putting another one on the pile. But if you can write a love song with a different twist and a different way to say it, right? you know, um, that's what separates you and and gets your songs, you know, out into the world faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we've got one left. All right. Um, postcards from paradise, same kind of deal, touch and go. Okay. Not the most consequential song, but it was a fun afternoon and it kind of kept my streak going for being on his records. An another one where he walked in and had the groove and had the notepad and, and look at it. And I saw touch and go and you know uh, uh you know Ringo what do you mean by that goes, I, I don't know you know you're the big Nashville songwriter what does it mean to you mm. and I'm going well you know it's it's kind of like uh I guess you could say that it's sort of like I I, I this can't be just a relationship where we just you know, do it and we leave and we leave and never see each other. Mm -hmm. If we're going to touch, I it, it, let's not have it just be touch and go. 
And that's not, you know, I love, I love songs where you look at the title and you think you know what it is. And then you hear the song, like you just said about the last song, yeah. the, uh, the wrong song. Yeah. You know, I love songs where you know it from the beginning and then you listen to it and you go, oh, and it makes you appreciate the craft. Right. Because it, it they would have had lunch so much quicker that day if they had just done it the normal way. But instead, they had to skip lunch, keep working all day to find that thing that makes you go, oh. And that's what, you know, that's what a song like that was. Ringo was the big one for, you know, the eight days a week and hard days night and, and the quick glib phrases that can mean a lot of things. And that, I thought Touch and Go was right up there with eight days a week, as far as the titles. Right. Okay. Well, these are all tremendous choices here. And it even means so much more coming from you since you worked with the man on, on these songs. So at some point, maybe, <laughs> I'd love to hear what you thought. Well, you did say about the 70s, your favorites were the hits. But... uh I don't know. I just love hearing different perspectives on deeper cuts. Well, and, uh, we'll have to do this again, and uh, and uh, it'll be the top ten from from nineteen seventy to to nineteen ninety eight. Okay, <laughs> you've already included a few songs from then, right? So you had well, you had Vertical Man stuff in there. So yeah, well, there wasn't that ninety eight, or that was ninety eight, and Santa Claus was ninety nine. I think ninety nine. Yes. Yep. Okay. It, there you it go. Was, we were uh, we were on fire, man. I, I every every other year, I got that phone call saying we're going over in March. Are you in? And you know, I kept the calendar free, just hoping for that phone call. And but it was, you know, it would it would take us a year to do the record. You know, a, a month to promote it. The rest of the year, everybody goes back to their day job, and then you get the phone call, and the big R lit up in the sky, and we descend on Cranley like so many cicadas. Well, you know, you could tell, especially those albums with, with you and, and Mark and the Roundheads, you said it took a year to make, and you can feel the effort put into those albums, you know? Um and to this day, I'm just so grateful that Ringo is as active as he is and still making the EPs and now an album. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I still wish that at some point he would have decided to tour with the Roundheads. I know that, you know, we've said this before, and I, I did see your show at um, Irving Plaza in New York with the Roundheads. I didn't see the bottom line show, but uh, my wife went to the one at, at uh, the bottom line and she said the people there in the audience knew the songs already. That's they great. The songs from Vertical Man and Ringo was great. shocked. How would they know this so soon? You know? Yeah, it was. I. We were standing behind the curtain and the announcer came, the guy that owns it, Alan Pepper. Yeah. Came over and said, all right, I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to say, ladies and gentlemen, Ringo Starr. And Ringo went, no. Ringo and the Roundheads. And that was the first we had ever heard it. We uh -huh. all looked at each other and went, I guess we're Roundheads. Ladies and gentlemen, Ringo and the Roundheads. And we came out and that was us. We were christened. We were Roundheads. You never heard the name before that? No. I'm going to say, ladies and gentlemen, Ringo. No. Ringo and the Roundheads. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I would guess that that, well... It could have been just Ringo that came up with it. It could have been Ringo and Mark because that all comes from the point. No, no, right. no. I would, no, I was standing next to Mark and he's yes. the one we looked at each other and went, what the, heck? is that in the point? Yeah. The, 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 um, the whole story is that the main character, Oblio, um, has a round head and everybody else in the town has a pointed head. Well, that's funny because Ringo afterwards told, tried to tell us, we figured it was some kind of dirty German name, you uh -huh. know, or, but then he tried to tell us that it was a political party, that there was a political party in Britain 
uh, you know, in the 1800s called the Roundheads. But now that's, you just told me a whole new origin story for being bitten by the radioactive Roundhead. Well, I know I said it to Mark and he said that's right, but I don't know if it was him and Mark that decided that. Well, all I could tell you is, you know, we were standing next to each other when he said it. We both looked at each other like, you know, what? But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe he kept secrets from me. You know, my memory's failing here, but it could be the other way around that that the character of OBO had a pointed head and everybody else had a round head. It was one or the other. <laughs> oh, well, that would be really sweet. And once again, another another call back to one of his dear friends, Harry. Right. Yeah. I'll take it. Okay. Before we go, I want to remind everybody, Gary has his own website, GaryBurr.com. That's right. And um, he has a couple of shows coming up. And, of course, the book, Reunion. We'll have my Gary website. back on to talk about that. And uh, in New York City, he's going to be doing two shows in a row. One is on July 7th. So he's not going to be with Ringo on July 7th on his birthday. <laughs> and I will be with Mark Hudson. Yes, you will. And that's with the Laurel Canyon Band. That's right. Room in New York. And then the following night um, at the Cutting Room as well with Nashville to New York. Right. With songwriter show with my wife, Georgia Middleman. Right. And uh, Victoria Shaw. Two big deal hit songwriters. Hmm. Okay. So I've got to catch down. more of your shows because I always love seeing you perform. I know I went to one show with you and Mark many years ago. Um, it was like a Nashville to New York show. It was the one I, I taught you about, and Olivia Newton John was in the audience. Yeah, I think that was a songwriter in the round. I mean, a songwriter show at the bottom line. Okay. Yeah, because that was when Olivia was there. Yeah. Okay. I think Steven Tyler was there, too. Yeah. It was quite a star-studded evening. Those were some great shows at the bottom line. Oh, definitely. So, thank you so much, Gary, for doing this. Continued success with your book. We'll have you back on to talk about that. Anytime you want to talk about Ringo, Beatles, come back here. Kenny thank Lockins, you. whatever you want to talk about. Thank you. It's fun. <laughs> and, and uh, thanks to all of you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. And uh, we're going to try to do some more specials for Ringo's birthday. But we can do specials anytime for any of the Beatles. You wanted to say something? No, just point oh. legit. <laughs> okay. And thanks so much. Here, What's that? That's a, pic that's a picture of the crowd at Woodstock. And I'm right in the middle of it. Oh. <laughs> were you right really there. there? Yeah. And I found a picture that actually has me in it. Wow. We have to have you on just to talk about that experience. I wish uh, I was there. You know. You're too young. I could have went. I would have been 10. <laughs> I'm only a few years younger than you, you know. Uh, okay. For critical years. Okay. And great picture of John behind me. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me, folks. We'll see you again soon. Thank you, Gary. And, uh, Take care, everyone. All my videos end like this. <laughs>